So um, my name is John Weltman, and I'm actually a graduate of Beaver, class of 75. I was the very first class of boys that graduated from Beaver. Um, but I'm here today to talk about my founding of what's now the largest surrogate parenting agency in the world. And I got told um, my first year as a lawyer that when I write a brief, I should tell people what I'm going to say, then say it, and then tell them what I just said. So I think I should start by just giving you an overview, because what they've asked me to say is, how did I find circle surrogacy or found circle surrogacy, and um, why was I passionate about it? And the answer to that is really simple. I fell into it. I felt like Godfather III, they dragged me into something I had no interest in, family law, um, because of circumstances. And yet I was passionate about it because I'm a gay man, I am the one of two of the first dads to ever have two children through the same surrogate mom in America. Our, my kids are now 27 and 29. Um, and so I was passionate for my own personal experience. My relationship with my surrogate continues today, 32 years after I met her. Literally just texted with her yesterday. Um, and so what I founded was something that came from my heart. Um, and, um, over the course of time, I eventually realized that I was not working 50% of my time in law and 50% of my time in this business. I was working 100% of my time in both and then throwing in things like being on the board at Beaver. So um, it was a very crazy time and ultimately turned exclusively to Circle as it was growing. Um, and it is now the largest surrogate parenting agency in the world. We have over 133 employees. We have over 3,000 births of children from 74 different countries for, as they said, gay, straight, single couples from all over the world. Um, I think it's best now, having summarized that, to go back and tell a little bit about my story and a little bit about how it all happened and then how it grew. Um, I graduated Beaver in 75, went on to Yale, um, then to Oxford, then to the University of Virginia, from which I have a BA, an MA in history, and a JD in law. Um, and um, I was going out into the world to be a lawyer. I was a commercial litigator at a large firm in Boston, did all kinds of civil litigation, mostly for big companies. Um, but I was a gay man. I had met my husband in uh, 1982 at the University of Virginia. Um, and um, I was married to him the first time in a Unitarian ceremony in Boston, well, in Easton, actually, um, uh, in 88. We then got civilly unioned when we were buying a house in Vermont in Vermont in 2002. And when Massachusetts passed marriage in 2004, they wouldn't accept a civil union as a marriage, so we had to get married again. And we didn't become federally legal till 2015. That's the history of gay marriage in America. Um, I had wanted kids from the very beginning and had heard stories about people who'd done this, um, and not surrogacy, but I just said to him from the very beginning, don't even come to Boston if you don't want to have kids. And he was like, no, no, I love kids, but I think you're out of your mind. Or you're holding on to your lost, long lost heterosexuality. So when we finally did have kids, um, what happened for us is it was financially beyond our means. My parents helped us with child number one. And about three months later, the surrogate wanted to get started again with child number two. And the agency said, if you can't come up with the funds, then she's not going to have two genetically related children for you. And so we were like, huh? Um, and it happened to be the case that um, I realized that I was going to be passed over for partner at my law firm because I was gay, which did happen. So I had taken the California bar um, to find myself someplace else to practice law. Um, and um, they, the agency we were using got sued for malpractice and asked me to represent them because I'd had a really good experience, was a California person, uh, admitted lawyer, and could uh, litigate cases. Well, we won that case. It was then appealed, and we won that case. And it's the only time, to my knowledge, that a jury has ever ruled on anything related to surrogacy. And I was all over the news. It was like, good morning, America, all kinds of things that were happening. And I started getting calls from everybody saying, you know, will you find me a surrogate? And I'm like, no, 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 
I don't do family law, that's divorce, I have no interest in that, uh, don't, don't drag me into this. Um, and then people said, well, but I found my sister, or I found my friend who will be my surrogate, could you do the legal work? And since I'd done that for the agency, and I knew a lot about the legal aspects of it, I said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So I began doing that for a little bit of time, and one woman who was a single woman physician out in New Mexico, found two women to screen, one a nurse and one a good friend of hers, to be her surrogate. They both passed screening. She chose the close friend because she was closer to that person. And on a Friday afternoon um, in October of 1995, this other woman who was a nurse who passed all her tests sent me a four-inch package of materials of psych testing and medical testing saying, hey, will you match me? And it was like 3 o'clock Friday afternoon. I said, well, on Monday I'm going to call her and say, I don't do this. And I went to a cousin's brunch in Brookline the next day where I was telling this funny story that happened to me to people who were friends of hers. Well, they also tended to be friendly with her ex-husband and his new bride who were going through the surrogacy process with a different agency in California. By Sunday, I had a phone call from them going, please, please, please don't give her away tomorrow. We have had a disaster at our agency and we'd like to use her. I'm like, no, 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 I don't do this. And they said, but you know how it goes well. We know how it goes badly. Let's work together. And I was like, well, I wouldn't know what to charge you. So they said, well, how about $5,000? So I said, OK, um, $27,000 of legal work later, um, and I didn't charge them more than $5,000. Um, they had a little boy. And they invited me about 11 months later to their home, a Jewish family had a circumcision for the baby and did something I've never seen in a circumcision before because they were an older couple. They wanted their community of younger friends to be connected to them, pass the baby up the family line with me being the last to hold the baby to say thank you the most. And I literally felt myself welling up with tears because I said, oh my God, I've traded money between Wendy's and uh, McDonald's between Polaroid and Kodak. I have never done anything this meaningful for anyone in my life. I, I want to do this. Um, and from their bathroom, <laughs> I called this woman who was a social worker because I had no idea how to find another surrogate, let alone how to screen one, um, and said, would you be interested? Because she had done a co-parenting arrangement. She was a lesbian. And um, I thought, you know, she might have some sense of how to do it. And she was helping let other lesbians find um, known donors. So um, together we put together a little business plan and the following year we had four kids and then 12 kids and then 25 kids and it kept growing and growing. And in the course of it, I consistently used my personal experience with my children to sort of set the standards of how we were going to do things. So for example, I found that my kids started asking questions at like three, um, where's my mommy? And I wanted to be able to introduce them to the woman who had carried them, and I did. Um, uh, at seven and eight, like which one of you is my daddy? They already knew genetics. And they're both disappointed, um, which I thought was wonderful. Um, and um, then the younger one, who isn't genetically mine, um, came to me and said, but you're still my dad, right? And I said, yeah. Um, and at 11, I think my older son turned to me and his grandmother on my husband's side had passed away and said, do we have any diabetes in our family? And I said, no. And I thought, you know, we have heart disease and cancer, but I'm not going to mention that to you right now. Um, so all these things had come up and I said, you know, it's really important for kids to know who their genetic parent is. Um, and there's this whole host of people we just passed along in Colorado helping children of uh, anonymous donation find their parents and have laws that work to do this. From the very beginning, I said, no, 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 all of our donors need to be available to be known to people so that they can find out genetics. I had a sister who died at 52 of the BRCA2 gene, and because she didn't know that until she was 45 and passed it on to my younger sister, she was able to remove her breasts and ovaries and actually be able to um, have uh, 
we still here today have children before that and move on with her life safely. So I felt like these are really important things. So I brought those ethical standards into things and I think that was a huge piece of the success of Circle was because I was personally involved. Many of the people I hired had either been surrogates, they'd been donors, they'd been intended parents, they'd gone through infertility and I wanted people who experienced that. Well, I got to about, um, let's see, it was about 2010, so that's about 15 years into the program, and I couldn't manage both the legal practice and the surrogate agency. I had about 12 in staff at that point, and I looked for space to move to. I decided to open my own legal practice because there was a lot of law involved in surrogacy. And within 10 months, we were up to 18 people. Within two years, we were up to 36 people working for me. And as you can tell, it's grown since then. I, I think that for me, um, it's been an absolutely extraordinary process because it's been the fulfillment of everything I love. I think the greatest thing I ever did was have my kids and have the courage to have them. I have women friends who are married to men who really didn't want to have kids. And in my generation, that was also very courageous. And I thought, good for them, standing up for what they believe in. I really wanted to do this. And it was really not an easy accomplishment. And it was the best thing I've ever done. So to be able to help other people do that meant the world to me. And there were countries like France that had very, very religious oppositions to surrogacy where I had the danger potentially of being indicted um, for committing a crime. Luckily, the European court came in and said, no, 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 it's not fair to treat children born through this process that you don't believe in the same way. Um, and so it has been a wonderful thing. I'm seeing pictures, so it must mean I'm supposed to finish. Um, but um, the bottom line is that I think if you do something that you're really passionate about and you bring your personal experience to it, it can change your life. And you have to make your own decisions about what that is, because when I was thinking about retiring, I turned to my kids, one of whom's an engineer, the other of whom's in his PhD program in paleontology, and said, would you like to take over? I'd, you know, this is how you came into the world, assuming they'd love it, and neither of them had any interest. And I wouldn't tell my kids what to do. They need to do what they love. Um, and so I think um, the bottom line here is, you know, do what you love, whatever that is, and I think you'll be a success. Thank you.